In Module 1 of this lecture, we saw how to find the optimal values for a constrained optimization problem. In this module, we'll see that lambda is not just a meaningless constant. It has a useful interpretation. We'll also work through an intuitive explanation, that is, not a formal proof, of why the Lagrange multiplier method works. We'll cover the second order conditions for maxima and minima in Module 3. Let's go back to our first example. Recall that the budget constraint was 4x1 plus 2x2 is equal to 60. What happens if we increase the right hand side by one unit? That is, our consumer has an extra dollar to spend on coffee and cookies. So that 4x1 plus 2x2 is equal to 61. Well, we can find new optimal solutions for the problem. We'll see that new optimal value for x1 is now 8 and 1 8. Likewise for x2, it will be 14 and 1 quarter and lambda will increase to 4 and 1 16th. Remember that the optimal solution in example 1 was 128 when the budget was 60. The new optimal solution is 132, an increase of 4 units. Let's see what's happening here. Imagine this is our original budget line, 4x1 plus 2x2 is equal to 60. We're going to increase the right hand side by 1 unit, our budget goes from 60 to 61. Here we have our new budget line, with a budget of 61. That means we'll have a new Lagrangian going along the surface of the objective function. And so we'll have a new constrained maximum here. If we compare those two maxima, we see that that increase is equal to lambda. This isn't a coincidence. This is what lambda tells us. It tells us by how much the objective function will change if we increase the resource available in the constraint by one unit. Lambda is called the shadow price of the resource. So the resource is the value on the right hand side of the constraint. First I'll explain where the term shadow price comes from and then we'll see why lambda is what it is. Imagine a firm produces two goods and the profit function is pi of x and y. We don't need to specify the function explicitly we just need to assume that the firm wants to maximise profit, subject to a labour constraint. Total hours of labour available at t. Product x takes t, subscript x hours to produce one unit. And likewise, product y takes t, subscript y hours to produce one unit. That means the labour constraint is this. t subscript x times x plus t subscript y times y is equal to capital T. So if t increases to t plus 1, that implies that delta pi is equal to lambda. So if profit increases by lambda, the firm should be willing to pay up to lambda for one extra hour of labour. We can contrast the shadow price to the market price. The shadow price is the maximum the firm should be willing to pay. The market price is what they actually have to pay. Now, if the shadow price is greater than the market price, the firm should employ an extra hour of labour, since that will increase their profit. This is how the shadow price came to be named. The term is now used in more general contexts. Let's turn to more formal interpretations of lambda. Here we'll introduce a new term, the optimal value function. Let's see what that means. As we saw in the diagram, increasing the right hand side of the constraint, C, changes the optimal solution. We designate the optimal solutions x star and y star. So we can have many optimal solutions x star, y star, that depend on the value of c. The optimal value function, then, is comprised of those values of the objective function that are optimal values given the constraint c is changing. Again, let's have a look at that on the diagram. Here we had an increase in the constraint by one unit. We can imagine the constraint moving outwards from the origin. And for each value of c, we'll have a different optimal solution. The green line here represents f star c, the optimal value of the function as c changes. So that's the optimal value function. We can also see the optimal value function by changing c in example 1. So let's call our budget b. That's a particular case of c, the right hand side of the constraint. We can take various values of b and solve for x1, x2 and lambda. As b increases, the objective function moves further away from the origin, moving outwards. 
and the optimal solution moves higher up along the surface of the objective function. That means we have a function of optimal values that depend on the optimal values of x1 and x2, which themselves depend on the right-hand side of the constraint. So that's the optimal value function. We've established what the optimal value function is, and that's a function of c. There's also an associated Lagrangian that depends on c. In other words, this is our objective function. We can construct a Lagrangian based on that in the usual way. Given that we have a Lagrangian, plus some regularity conditions, namely conditions that ensure that constraints are finite and bounded, it can be shown, a famous phrase in mathematics, it can be shown that the first root of, of our optimal value function with respect to c is equal to lambda c, because lambda is a function of c as well. In other words, the Lagrange multiplier is the rate at which the optimal value of the objective function changes with respect to the changes in the constraint c. That's just a mathematical statement of the definition we had before. Now let's look at another example, and this time we'll interpret the Lagrange multiplier. In example 2, a firm produces two goods, x and y, and has this total revenue function. The first two terms of the revenue function relate to the revenue from x. That would be the price of x times the quantity of x. The second two terms relate to the revenue from y with the price of y times the quantity of y. There's also this budget constraint. For example, the number of hours of labour available may be limited to 80 hours. In such an example, it would take 5 hours to produce 1 unit of x and 10 hours to produce 1 unit of y. The firm will want to maximise total revenue. What we're going to do is find the first order conditions for a maximum. We can't demonstrate that's a maximum at this stage because we don't have the second order conditions. We'll also solve for lambda and interpret the Lagrange multiplier. The first step is to state the problem in mathematical terms. That would be max total revenue equal to 36x minus 3x squared plus 56y minus 4y squared. Subject to the constraint 5x plus 10y is equal to 80. The second step is to form the Lagrangian. L is equal to the objective function, 36x minus 3x squared plus 56y minus 4y squared, minus lambda times the constraint. Recall that's g of xy minus c, 5x plus 10y minus 80. We have the Lagrangian. Step three is to find the first order conditions. Differentiating the Lagrangian with respect to x will be L1 prime. We'll have 36 minus 6x. The y terms are treated as constants here, so that will be minus 5 lambda. That comes from differentiating this term. These two terms are constant with respect to x, so the first derivative is equal to 0. We set that equal to 0 until we find the partial with respect to y. L2 prime is equal to 56 minus 8y minus 10 lambda equals 0. For the third equation we state the constraint 5x plus 10y is equal to 80 and we can number those. So 1, 2 and 3. The fourth step is to solve for x, y and lambda. From equation 1 we solve for lambda in terms of x. Lambda is equal to 36 minus 6x on 5. From 2, again we solve for lambda. Lambda is equal to 56 minus 8y on 10. Since the right-hand side of both of these equations equals lambda, they're equal to each other. That implies that 36 minus 6x on 5 is equal to 56 minus 8y on 10. We can simplify that. 4y is equal to 6x minus 8. And one step further, y is equal to 1.5x minus 2. We'll call that equation 4. So we can substitute for y in equation 3. Equation 3 was 5x plus 10y equals 80. 
So begin for y, that implies that 5x plus 10 times 1.5x minus 2 is equal to 80. We can simplify that. I have 20x equals 100 and divide through by 20, x equals 5. We'll call that x naught since it's an optimal value. y naught then is equal to 1.5x minus 2. So that's 1.5 times 5 minus 2. It's equal to 5.5. We can substitute into either of those equations for lambda. Well, 36 minus 6x on 5 is equal to 36 minus 6 times 5 on 5. And that's equal to 1.2. We have x naught is equal to 5. Y naught is equal to 5.5 and lambda equals 1.2. Next we interpret lambda. Remember the constraint was 5x plus 10y equals 80. The way we interpret lambda is we think about increasing the right hand side of the constraint by one unit to 81. In that case the optimal value of the objective function will increase by 1.2 units, the value of lambda. So there we have a standard interpretation of lambda in words. To finish off, let's look at how total revenue changes. First we find the optimal value of total revenue. We do that by substituting in the optimal values of x and y. And that gives us 292. So if the firm can find an extra unit of the constraint, it can increase its total revenue from 292 to 293.2. Now that we have a better understanding of the Lagrange multiplier, let's look at why the Lagrangian method works. This text explains the diagram on the next slide. We'll go directly to the diagram. The objective function is this concave function. We have the constraint. The curve K shows the value of the objective function directly above the constraint. So basically that's our Lagrangian. We see that the maximum point of the constraint function is B. A is the unconstrained maximum. So this diagram is similar to the diagram we looked at earlier. However, this one has level lines drawn on it. Level lines are similar to the contour lines on a map that show height. We can see that on the left. On the right, we see the level lines projected onto the xy plane. The constraint is also shown. Curve K reaches the maximum and just touches this level line here. So that's the same line there. We're interested in the optimal point B, or as it's shown on the right, B prime, at that point the level line and the constraint have the same slope. We can draw a tangent to both lines at that point. In the xy plane we can express the slope of the tangent in terms of dy dx. We didn't cover it in this course, but it can be shown that the slope of any level line in the xy plane is given by this equation. f of xy is a function of two variables. And because it's constrained to a value c, it's a level line. The slope of the level line in the xy plane is given by dy dx. dy dx is equal to minus f1 prime over f2 prime. In other words, minus the ratio of the first partial derivative with respect to x over the first partial derivative with respect to y. We saw how we can have a level line for the objective function. We can also treat the constraint as a level curve. We saw at point B prime in the xy plane that the slope of the constraint was equal to the slope of the level line of the function. So using this equation, we can have this relationship. On the left we have minus the first partial of the constraint with respect to x divided by the first partial with respect to y. And on the right we have minus the first partial of the level line with respect to x divided by the first partial with respect to y. Remember they're equal at point B because those two curves are tangent. We can rearrange these two ratios. We get rid of the minus signs. On the left we have a ratio of the first partials with respect to x. And on the right we have a ratio of the first partials with respect to y. These ratios are equal to each other. Let's make them equal to lambda. So given that we can multiply through by the denominator at g1 prime in the first case. That gives us this equation. 
If we look at the second ratio, we can multiply through by G2 prime. That gives us this equation. Well, what are these equations? They're the first order conditions for our Lagrangian. If we have first order conditions for a function, then it follows we have a stationary point. So these first order conditions are the first order conditions for point B here, the maximum of the constrained objective function. We've seen how we derive the first order conditions. We have three unknowns, x, y and lambda. If we add the constraint, we have three equations and three unknowns. So that's one method of finding the first order conditions for a Lagrangian. In the next module, we'll look at the second order conditions for the Lagrangian.